Conventional medicine says, says don't take desiccated thyroid because it'll cause or worsen autoimmune thyroid disorders. However, desiccated thyroid hormone has never been shown to cause autoimmune thyroid disorders. Um, we have autoimmune thyroid disorders increasing at epidemic rates over the last 30 years. We're using much less desiccated thyroid hormone over the last 30 years than we were using the 30 years previously to that because we're using synthetic uh, uh, T4 derivatives, Synthroid and Levothroid now. So I say, as Cora said in the commercial, where's the beef? And let's find out if there is beef behind those conventional arguments or not. So Thomas Jefferson said, he who knows nothing is closer to the truth than he whose mind is filled with falsehoods and errors. And again, we're back to the falsehoods about iodine causing uh, autoimmune thyroid disorders or worsening thyroid disorders. Let's, let's, let's talk about two common illnesses out there, medical iodophobia, which we talked about earlier, medical desiccated thyrotophobia. Um, now, we dealt with medical iodophobia earlier. This, this one will deal with both medical iodophobia and medical desiccated thyrotophobia. So medical iodophobics claim iodine causes autoimmune thyroid disorder, hypothyroidism, such as iodine-induced hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, locusts, frogs, plague, darkness, and more. <laughs> you want more information about that? Go to Passover. So, iodine is present in every cell of the body. The glands and cells concentrate iodine against the gradient, and that's transported by the sodium iodine symporter. The sodium iodine symporter transports sodium and iodine into the cell at a concentration gradient 20 to 50 times that of the plasma. It's an ATP-dependent process, and we need energy to do that process. In this case, one atom of sodium and one atom, I'm sorry, one atom of iodine and two atoms of sodium are transported into the cell in the same direction. So let's break this down. Now, um, who's using iodine out there in your patients? What's one of the first things you'll see on a blood, thyroid blood test that makes you consider maybe you're causing a problem with thyroid? TSH goes up. So is that a problem? She says you might think it is. I can tell you for the vast majority of people, it's not a problem. And here, here's why. Sodium iodine symport is shown here in the yellow box, and it's like a taxi cab that moves iodide from the serum across the apical membrane into the thyroid gland. These taxi cabs are made by TSH. Our, our body is not dumb where we're going to make all these taxi cabs to transport iodine if there's no iodine to transport. So the first thing that's going to happen when you give someone iodine is it needs to make more of these symporters, more sodium iodine symporter, more taxi cabs. The way to do that is it stimulates, TSH goes up to stimulate that. How long does TSH stay up for when you start someone on iodine, generally? Three to six months, exactly what I was going to say in the vast majority of people, three to six months, sometimes a little shorter, sometimes a little longer. How high can the TSH go up for most people? Bueller, anyone? She's seen 12, 20. Fine, I was going to say 6 to 15 for most people, occasionally 20 or higher. Um, is this causing iodine-induced hypothyroidism? The answer is no for the vast majority of people because if you're talking to patients, what are they going to, are they feeling better or worse? The vast majority are feeling better. They're not giving you symptoms of hypothyroidism. They don't have slow reflexes. Um, they don't have lower basal body temperatures, and they don't have Low, they don't have T3 and T4 issues on their blood work. They're all normalized. So TSH stimulates sodium iodine symporter, so you can transport iodide into the cell. Iodide has to undergo oxidation via hydrogen peroxide and thyroperoxidase to iodine. The reason we need iodine is it has to be organified to thyroglobulin and hooked on to the tyrosine molecules of thyroglobulin. And at the RDA for iodine, you produce thyroid hormone. T1, T2, T3, T4. This has been a 10-year project to come through with this mechanism. Now, at 100 times the RDA for iodine, you can make iodinated lipids in the thyroid and in the breasts, and it's also been shown in the ovaries. And it's delta iodolactone is the most common one that's produced. Jonathan Wright mentioned it earlier today. Um, in, the, as re, in relation to the breast tissue, you also make this in the thyroid. And you make other iodinated lipids. However, you don't make delta iodolactone at the RDA for iodine, only at 100 times the RDA for iodine. That's the mechanism of what iodine does for the thyroid. Keep in mind this, this 
Organification of lipids, the iodification of lipids only occurs when iodine's in the excess of the RDA for iodine. So here's the formula for, for delta iodolactone. It uses arachidonic acid plus iodine. You, you throw in thyroid peroxidase and you get delta iodolactone. Delta iodolactone is a key regulator of apoptosis and cellular proliferation of the thyroid. It's not detected in human tissue when iodine deficiency is present, but is present with iodine administration at 100 times the RDA for iodine. What's the RDA for iodine? 150 micrograms, 100 times is about 15 milligrams. Exactly around the doses that I'm talking about, 12 to 50 milligrams a day for most people. Now, MNU-induced tumors contain four times more arachidonic acid than normal mammary glands. Um, what's happened is if there's not enough iodine, there's arachidonic acid, these, these, these toxic metabolites can build up in these tissues and cause problems. Iodine supplementation is accompanied by a tenfold higher delta iodolactone content in tumors. And the same research shows that delta iodolactone and iodine have anti-proliferative and apoptotic properties of breast tissue and thyroid tissue, and probably other tissues in the body where it's concentrated as well. So where does the granified iodine hit the cell? It hits it here at G0 and G2. But let's, let's take a step up from here and see where this aspect of the pathway occurs. Peroxide is supplied locally via oxidative phosphorylation, the NADPH oxidase system. Um, and the, what are the rate limiting, what B vitamins are related to the NADPH oxidase system? B3, she's right, there's another one, it's B2. Um, so B2 and B3 are important to get this pathway going. And you'll know from many of my writings, I frequently recommend people take B2 and B3 if they have autoimmune thyroid disorders to try and regulate this process a little bit better. But this process is stimulated by calcium and inhibited by iodinated lipids. You can start to see what's going to happen if we don't make these iodinated lipids. Problems are going to develop, and we'll, we'll go through that. So let's look at too low of iodine where you're not making iodinated lipids. You could say too low would be the RDA for iodine, because we know we need 100 times the RDA for iodine to make iodinated lipids in the thyroid. So we have low iodine levels. It still gets transported via the sodium iodine symporter stimulated by TSH into the thyroid gland. And we get decreased iodide, because we're starting off with decreased iodide. It has, still has to go, undergo oxidation to iodine. It still has to undergo organification to make thyroid hormone. Now, these are, this is the picture you'll see where patients have, in the, normal, in the normal reference range, they'll have slightly elevated T3 and slightly lower T4 levels. She, she's seen it because she's shaking her head. I've seen it. It bugged me for years on why I was seeing this in patients, and I never understood it until I really started to study this iodine. And it's basically iodine deficiency causing this. Um, they will produce thyroid hormone, but they get screwy levels of thyroid hormone. So will they produce iodinated lipids in this case? Bueller, anyone? Yes or no? No. They're starting off low, they're at the RDA or lower. They need 100 times the RDA to make iodinated lipids. So no, they're not going to make that. Now, they're still going to supply hydrogen peroxide to create oxidation um, and to help make thyroid hormone. However, you're losing the iodinated lipids, but there's still local, locally produced calcium in there, or locally, calcium still locally available there. And this is the start of autoimmune thyroid disorders. So what happens is TP, the theory is TPO gets damaged from peroxide and starts an oxidative reaction, a fire burning in the thyroid. And it's occurring because there's not enough iodine in the system. What's the body's first defense mechanism against this? What do you see? What do you, you're going to draw a blood test, and you're going to see this defense mechanism on your blood work. TPO antibodies and anti-TPO anti antibodies and anti-thyroglobulin antibodies. Those are the firemen coming to the rescue to put this fire out that's burning. You're going to pick it up on your blood work. The first thing that should hit your mind is, hey, maybe they're low on iodine, because that sets the stage for this to happen. So how do you treat it? OK, you give iodine. What else could you give? B2 and B3 to help straighten the system around. What about to buffer this excess calcium? Magnesium, that would be a good choice. What else to settle the oxidative fire burning in the thyroid? Fine, an antioxidant. Fine, any antioxidant you want. So what I found is the treatment would be iodine, magnesium, B2 and B3, selenium. Selenium has a strong antioxidant effect in the thyroid. 
vitamin C as well as other antioxidants. That has worked for me, and I'm sure if you'll try it, it'll work for you, unless I got different patients than you do.